Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. This is your brother Daniel Haygadju. Dr. Iyad Qunaybi is one of the most renowned du'at in the Arab world. He recently made a critical video on Afghanistan and the end of the occupation. I want to share a translation of his video so that English speakers can benefit as well. With the withdrawal of foreign forces from Afghanistan and the rising fear of an Islamic government coming to power, international institutions and media claim to worry about women and human rights in Afghanistan. Today, we'll review with you examples of women's rights and human rights that Afghans enjoyed under the 20 years of occupation. Let's see how fair, honest, and caring the international institutions and global media were in those past 20 years. Recently, the United Nations, the sponsor of gay rights, issued a historic reaction to the end of the occupation. I quote, at this critical moment, the people of Afghanistan look to the Human Rights Council to defend and protect their rights. The need to prevent the commission of human rights abuses of even greater magnitude and scope make this an essential meeting. The article published by the United Nations states, Afghanistan faces a cultural disaster following the fall of Kabul to Taliban forces. A UN official also urged countries to provide immediate assistance to human rights defenders, including those working on women's and cultural rights, as well as artists trying to flee the country. The American newspaper Time titled an article, What Afghanistan's Women Stand to Lose. The French newspaper France 24 inquires about the fate of women after the return of Taliban to power. DW writes, the Taliban have vowed to take a more moderate stance that women's rights will be honored, but both the UN and Germany have expressed skepticism. Al Arabiya titled an article, Women's Fears from the Taliban Rule. Similarly, in Muslim countries, we have those who are seemingly concerned with women and human rights. For example, there is the film producer of the documentary In Seven Years, Mohammed Aql, who is supposedly so understanding of the apostasy of Muslim youth. This man expressed his deep aversion to the Taliban statement that they would allow women to go to school and work as long as they abide by the hijab. He considers this policy to be despotic, oppressive, and authoritarian. The situation, my brothers, is dangerous and the world is afraid for the rights of women and human beings in Afghanistan. But I bring you good news today. There is a glimmer of hope, as the U.S. President Joe Biden said in his speech, We'll continue to speak out for the basic rights of the Afghan people, of women and girls, just as we speak out all over the world. So cheer up everyone, America will not abandon you Afghanistan, neither will the United Nations who stated that Afghan women's rights are a red line. Let's now consider examples of the amazing human rights that the whole world fears will be lost with the end of the Western occupation. Everything I will mention is documented from Western sources. And before I begin, let me make this disclaimer. A lot of the following is disturbing, and heartbreaking, but bear with me, because together we are going to achieve three very important goals, inshallah. One, building Muslim awareness. This episode is perhaps one of the best in revealing to us the truth about the international media and organizations who keep their eyes on us when it comes to humanity and human rights and women's rights. Two, documenting this historical period of the 20-year occupation. There is now a systematic effort to erase the traces of our contemporary history from the internet. Many clips and images have been deleted so that when you come to tell your son, who is smitten by the West, that these people did so and so to the Muslims, he'll ask you, where is the evidence? You can go show him this very video. So upload it to your devices and show it to your children and let them pass it on to their children. We have made a great effort to collect this scattered information for you. Three, taking the opportunity to invite the world to Islam. The Wall Street Journal published an article a few days ago in the wake of the end of the occupation titled The Unconquerable Islamic World. Everyone on earth is now looking at how the great world powers were defeated at the hands of this simple Muslim country. 
They're baffled trying to figure out the secret to Muslim strength and steadfastness to figure out how Islam is the source of victory. Documenting what happened helps enlighten people about the true enemies of humanity, those who hide the facts from their people and turn them away from the religion of Allah. So these are our three goals. Try to endure what you'll hear and see in this video and remember that your Afghan brothers and sisters have endured much, much more for the past 20 years. Also, before we start, I'll use the word occupation to indicate the countries that occupied Afghanistan for 20 years. We don't care to pinpoint a particular country, but we only care that this was an occupation of a Muslim country by those who disbelieve in Islam. As we know from the Quran, when Allah says, We have not sent you, O Muhammad, except as a mercy to the worlds. This is our message that we carry to all the peoples of the world, and our main objection is against those who block the path to Allah and drive their people to unjust wars for their personal profit. Also, dear viewers, when we use words like client government and client army, we mean the Afghan mercenaries from who the occupation formed a puppet government and puppet army. We will focus on four pivotal points, children's rights, women's rights, prisoner rights, and human rights in general. Let's start with the rights which the Afghan children enjoyed during the occupation and which the media and international institutions fear that the Afghans will lose with the withdrawal of the Western militaries. Children are innocent. They have not killed anyone, so there's no doubt that they deserve the largest number of rights. In the last 10 years, the occupation has directly murdered approximately 7,800 Afghan children. Hundreds of thousands more were killed as a result of displacement, epidemics, cold, hunger, and malnutrition. This is in addition to the hundreds of thousands of children who were orphaned as a result of occupation forces murdering their parents in airstrikes. Not to mention those who received lifetime disabilities from injuries and amputations who now live with every possible form of misery. So here is the occupier coming out of Afghanistan. Afghanistan in 2021, and the children are scavenging the garbage while 10 million children require help, and while the whole situation culminates in the miserable features of this child. According to one article, the health of nearly 1 million children is at risk, according to UNICEF. We hear a lot about the occupation encouraging education in Afghanistan, but it seems that their encouragement consisted of bombing children in their schools, as in this bombing of a religious school in 2007, ending the lives of seven children. Then, in October 2020, the bombing of a religious school in the province of Tahar, killing 11 children with their teacher. When a group of children completed memorizing the Quran and a ceremony was held for them and their families, the occupation planes did not forget to send them a special graduation present. They dropped a bomb on them as they celebrated in their school on the day of the ceremony, April 2nd, 2018. The occupation-backed aircraft bombed a Qur'an memorization school in Kunduz, Afghanistan during the graduation ceremony of the memorizers and students. The bombing killed and wounded about 200 graduates, their parents and other attendees. These two boys in the picture are brothers whose mother was awaiting for them to celebrate together after the graduation ceremony, but they returned to her as corpses. Almost a month before that, the Air Forces bombed another party in which a number of memorizers were killed, including this boy. And he got the highest honors in memorizing the Quran in Afghanistan. Ceremonies turned into funerals, and the faces of the children were literally torn apart after the joy of graduation. Joy turned into horror and laughter turned into screaming. The pages of the Qur'an strewn all over, stained with the blood of innocence. Bombing religious schools and graduation ceremonies. Wasn't this occupation all about education for children? Well, actually it was 
all about education, especially so-called sex education. Yes, sex education can refer to boys and girls learning about maturity and protecting themselves from harassment. You might have thought sex education for Afghanistan meant that, but if you want to know what they really mean by sex education, watch this documentary titled War on Children. Its producers are not Muslims, but you can watch the horrifying details and associations meant to teach children obscenities and to groom them under the banner of so-called sex education. And all of this happened with the full support of the United Nations. In Afghanistan, there was a UN organization called the United Nations Population Fund. Visit their website to read their goals, which include teaching life skills in developing better relationships with romantic and sexual partners. They promote gays, lesbians, transgender men and women. They promote abortion. The United Nations Fund has worked to inject its ideas for generations into primary and secondary school education in Afghanistan. Yes, they consider all of this to be children's rights, and so they try to educate students and help them, but from their very own warped perspective. What is noteworthy is how this UN fund was complicit in assisting some governments to induce sterilization and abortion in women. They were even implicated in helping China to induce sterilization and forcing abortions in Muslim women in Turkestan. Even the Trump administration withheld U.S. funding when it was discovered that this U.N. fund was involved in such activities. So why play with words? Why do you see on their websites calling it quote-unquote comprehensive sexuality education, but when they address the Afghans, they use the term quote-unquote family life education? Another org also offered Afghanistan sex education, namely the IPPF, the International Planned Parenthood Federation, a British association. This org has a top priority to promote homosexuality and transsexualism, as they proudly state on their website. They state that girls and women have the full right to owning their bodies and having sex with whomever they please. But what if they get pregnant? The org stipulates the need to make abortion available to all women. Furthermore, they actively combat any attempt to legally criminalize abortion. There are other organizations that go after Afghan women in refugee camps for the purposes of sex education, as shown in this documentary. Do these institutions openly invite Afghan women to their agendas? Maybe not in explicit terms, but these are the ultimate goals that they aspire to reach gradually, just as they have reached them in many countries of the world. These institutions are now expressing their fear of losing their achievements, quote unquote, in Afghanistan after the withdrawal of the occupation and the new control of, quote unquote, hardliners. So when you hear from Western countries and media about educating children in Afghanistan, let's remember that this is part of what they mean. Yes, but they surely also taught the children how to avoid harassment and rape, perhaps. But did this really benefit them when documentation shows rampant child molestation from the occupying soldiers? In this clip, you'll see how a group of Afghan women and girls were dragged to a military base and then brutally raped to such an extent that one of the girls died from hemorrhaging. Perhaps these are individual cases. Individual cases? Look at this report on the occupation's involvement in helping to enslave and rape Afghan children, especially boys. This report from the World Socialist website, which talks about practices supported by the occupation, in which contractors who worked for DynCorp were found to have bought drugs and boys with the help of Afghan authorities. They then held these boys hostage, forcing them to dress up and dance before sexually assaulting them for extended periods of time. Once these boys escape their enslavement, they are left with deep psychological, emotional, and social trauma. This phenomenon is known as boy play, and there are painful details that I could never bring myself to mention. There are detailed documentaries on the issue of child trafficking and prostitution and how Afghan children were kidnapped for this purpose.
It was documented that between the years 2010 and 2016, about 6,000 cases of sexual abuse of children were recorded without any consequence for the rapists. And this was only during six of the 20 years of occupation. The British newspaper The Independent stated that the occupation soldiers admitted that they had been instructed to keep quiet about the Afghan soldiers who sexually abused boys. Sometimes the occupation soldiers used to have fun and laugh as they bombed villages and killed children, like in this video. <laughs> This was part of the so-called rights of children that they enjoyed during the occupation. Let's move now to women's rights. Why is there a spotlight on women's rights in Afghanistan? Could it be because those capitalists who want to profit from war created a false pretext to sell an unjust war to their own people? Could it be that they distorted the status of Afghan women under the Taliban for exactly this purpose? Consider this report from Vox. It admits the U.S. used women's rights to help justify the invasion of Afghanistan, which is what WikiLeaks also says about using the issue of women to, quote, reduce Western opposition to military occupation of Afghanistan. Everything we've mentioned about the suffering of children has also been suffered by Afghan women, because those women are the mothers of those children. When an Afghan woman sees her child killed in airstrikes, or starved, or sick, or frozen to death, or her daughter comes back to her after being raped by soldiers, physically and psychologically destroyed, or when her son is kidnapped to be sold in prostitution, or is killed at school or during a graduation ceremony of the Qur'an, all of this is a forgotten form of suffering for Afghan women. In a report by the BBC, you will find the following sentence. Afghanistan ranks as one of the worst countries in the world for women. When was that? Before women were liberated from the Taliban regime, right? No, this was in 2019, meaning after 18 years of occupation. The report continues. A United Nations report issued in 2018 detailed how women who are victims of sexual crimes and violence are pressured to withdraw their complaints. In many cases, they are blamed for the offenses committed against them. If you want to know the rights of women under the occupation and the client government, then you should read this report in the BBC. It describes senior officials in the client government and how they treated women as sexual commodities. They would exchange employment opportunities opportunities for sexual favors. This corruption even reached the client government's judges and police so that a woman couldn't even lodge a complaint against these officials. And when was this BBC report published? In 2019, after 18 years of occupation. They tell you that Afghan women have finally been able to play football in matches that everyone can watch and that this is a great achievement for them. But there's a catch. This came at the cost of even football coaches treating women as sexual commodities. The BBC even published an article titled, Afghan Women's Football Dreams Turned into Nightmare. Another news report, Afghan police women are being sexually harassed by male policemen. And female prisoners are being sexually molested by the police to such an extent that they describe the police as ravenous wolves. In this clip, it was reported that police were renting female prisoners out by the hour to male prisoners for large sums of money. Among the women's rights gained under the occupation is the rape of women in entire villages and suburbs at the hands of the Northern Alliance, supported by the occupation. This research paper discusses how the occupation used the Northern Alliance gangs in the war against the Taliban, and how the Alliance carried out sweeping operations and systematic rape of women to humiliate them and their families.
When you hear women's rights in Afghanistan, remember the state of rampant frenzy created by the occupation in which women were viewed as cheap commodities. And when an Afghan girl or woman wants to marry legally, the occupation planes do not forget to give her a gift on her wedding day. A bomb falls on the wedding, turning it into shredded bones and blood. It seems that the occupation particularly enjoyed bombing weddings as it bombed a wedding in Uruzganin in 2002 according to CNN. Then another wedding was bombed on the 6th of July 2008 in the province of Haska, Maine. Victims of the bombing were 47 Afghan Muslims, 39 of them were women and children according to The Guardian, and among the dead was the bride as well. A third wedding a few months later, on the 3rd of November 2008 in Kandahar, 40 Afghans were killed, only 7 of them were men and the rest were women and children, and others were wounded including the bride. What was the reaction of the occupation army when faced with these incidents? Quite simply, the army spokesman said, If innocent people were killed in this operation, we apologize and express our condolences. That's all. Just some cheap meaningless words before they continued their merciless wedding bombing campaign. They bombed a fourth wedding in Kandahar in the year 2010 and the victims were 40 killed and more than 70 wounded as reported by the UN. And a fifth wedding in Kandahar in 2018 and a sixth wedding in Helmand in 2019. The wedding became a funeral for 42 Afghans including children. This is what we found with a quick search and Allah knows best about how many others. How many women suffered after their homes were bombed and their children were killed? This is a picture I saved from the newspapers showing the suffering of women who were displaced into refugee camps by the airstrikes of the International Coalition. I'll also never forget a report by Al Jazeera in 2001 showing a video of an Afghan woman in a refugee camp who kept the remains of her husband who died in the bombing, in a bundle. And every time she opened this bundle and looked into it, she would fall into an epileptic seizure, and people would hold her still in place so she wouldn't harm herself while seizing. During the rule of the Taliban, Taliban scholars made fatwas against opium production resulting in the elimination of the industry. But then the industry resurfaced and flourished under the occupation. This is a documented fact that many people are ignorant of. Drugs spread and caused the addiction of many Afghan women, as in this report by the BBC, written in Farsi and published in 2018. This report tells us how one-third of the inmates who were imprisoned for security issues or so-called terrorism, including women and children, were subjected to torture or ill-treatment in the prisons of Afghanistan. Compare all this to what happened with the British journalist Vaughn Ridley, correspondent of the Sunday Times, who sported an Afghan cloak and toured Afghanistan before the start of the war on the Taliban while she was filming with her camera. The Taliban eventually arrested her under the suspicion of being a spy. Then she told us her story. According to her, Muslims treated her well and told her about Islam. Her boss in the Sunday Times offered the Taliban money in exchange for her release, but the Taliban refused and released her for free, asking her only to learn about Islam. She actually read, learned, and then converted to Islam two years after her release. Check out Dr. Iyad's episode, Liberation of Western Women, the full story, to know more about those who advocate for the liberation of women. Among them are those who humiliated women in their countries and turned them into commodities, insulting their dignity and then claiming to care about the rights of Afghan women. Now let us look at the rights of the prisoners of war among those who claim to be worried about human rights in Afghanistan. Let's see how they really conform with the Geneva Conventions on the rights of prisoners. Brutal arrests, dragging prisoners in degradation, no consideration for the elderly. In several incidents, prisoners were placed in shipping containers without food, drink, or a breathing space until they all died of suffocation. The Northern Alliance forces supported by the occupier used to kill their prisoners in horrific ways, as in these pictures that were reported by the American newspapers at the time. 
for a wounded Taliban soldier who was mercilessly dragged by the Northern Alliance soldiers, and then they killed him. And whoever lived long enough to be put in prison was tortured in a variety of ways. Amnesty International released a report titled Afghanistan, NATO countries at risk of complicity in torture and many other reports about the inhumane treatment of prisoners. A human right is to kill prisoners and bury them in mass graves. Compare all this with what the Muslims used to do with their captives when they heard the words of their Lord Almighty and Sublime, and they give food to the poor, the orphan, and the captive, though they love it for themselves. After we saw the rights of children, women, and prisoners, let us now look at other examples of general human rights as achieved by the occupation of Afghanistan across the 20 years. Killing for amusement and competition, this was practiced by male and female soldiers of different Western nationalities. They competed together about who kills more defenseless and unarmed Afghans. One headline reads, Australian SAS killed for sport in Afghanistan. Soldiers let their dog loose on an Afghan farmer who is working for his livelihood. The dog tears his flesh and then a soldier approaches the terrified Afghan, not to save him from the dog, but to shoot him three times, point blank, killing him instantly. Here we see occupying soldiers having fun by cutting off the fingers of their dead Afghan civilians and keeping them for trophies. Others enjoy taking pictures next to their victims, like this defenseless Afghan boy, Mudin, only 15 years old, taking turns next to him, then cutting off his fingers to keep it as a trophy. Is it human rights when the occupation soldiers enjoy urinating on the dead bodies of Afghan Muslims? And they cremate their bodies. They even broadcast scenes of burning Afghans for fun, as reported by The Guardian. They used to bomb weddings, as we mentioned, not only weddings, but funerals as well. In 2007, in the province of Kunar, nine died in an airstrike by the occupation. Then a group of Muslims went out to bury them, but the occupation bombed the funeral and killed another 27 people. In the same year, in another village, also in Kunar, the airstrike destroyed five houses, killing 27 Muslims and wounding others. The neighbors came to unearth the dead bodies, but the occupation planes bombed them as well, killing an unknown number of them, as in this report by the UN. In 2015, some Muslims went out for a funeral and a plane bombed them, killing 34 people. These dead were fathers, their wives were widowed, their sons and daughters were orphaned, and their mothers lost them. Are you now understanding the meaning of women's rights? Across the 20-year war, the United States alone dropped 58,602 bombs on Afghanistan. Hospitals took their fair share of these bombings in many so-called accidents, such as the bombing of Kunduz Hospital, which claimed the lives of 42 patients and staff. They extracted patients whose bodies were completely charred. Even innocent farmers had their fair share of the bombs, as in this news by Reuters about the bombing that killed 30 farmers who were only taking a break from the fields. There's anger and confusion on this pine nut farm. The drone strike came when workers were resting after a day's work. Don't the Americans see that they were just working and gathering pine nuts? Why do they attack ordinary workers? And since the occupation, it's been open season on Afghanistan. Since Afghan blood was deemed cheap, anyone was welcome to come spill it. Thus, you see a country lecturing Muslims about women's rights and human rights while hosting a number of quote-unquote human rights organizations. Yet when they want to market their warplane technology, they think, well, why not try out our bombs on Afghans? Why waste it on empty land in the desert? This brilliant marketing strategy was suggested in 2008. Thanks to the occupation, poverty in Afghanistan has risen to 72% in 2020, and of course, countless women are suffering from that. Thanks to the occupation, Afghanistan has become the second highest country in the world in terms of number of displaced people, second only to Syria. 
2.7 million Afghans have been displaced to other countries, and another 4 million have been rendered homeless and internally displaced inside Afghanistan. About a quarter of a million dead, more than 70,000 of them were defenseless civilians, and twice as many were killed because of starvation and epidemics. Remember, however, the statement of the Ministry of Defense of the occupying country at the beginning of the war in 2001. And to drive home the point, this is not an attack against Afghanistan or its people. Today's strikes ended with an airdrop of food, 35,000 packets, to starving Afghan refugees. Western media was circulating pictures like this, with an American soldier laying a quilt over a detainee during a mission in southeastern Afghanistan. They're insulting the intelligence of their own people with such images, with such propaganda. Imagine that after 15 years of these atrocities, the International Criminal Court issued a report about evidence that U.S. forces committed war crimes in Afghanistan. And you see this piece of news after 18 years of these practices, saying that the U.K. government and military are accused of war crimes cover-up. Yet, what was the fate of these accusations? Quite simply, the envoy of the United States of America replied, We never targeted innocents. Just like that. Case closed. No harm done. The real question is, how dare the International Criminal Court question America? So the New York Times published an article last year titled, U.S. to penalize war crimes investigators looking into American troops. Here's an excerpt. The Trump administration warned on Thursday, accusing a Hague-based court of corruption and maintaining that the United States can prosecute its own military and intelligence personnel. The sanctions come more than two years after the International Criminal Court announced an inquiry into allegations of crimes against humanity, including torture and rape, by U.S. forces in Afghanistan. This was published in the BBC. The U.S. even threatened that Americans can be sanctioned if they materially support the ICC. Now just imagine for a second, what if show trials are actually held just to save face and throw some low-level perpetrators under the bus to give the appearance of accountability? No problem. Some kind-hearted American official like Donald Trump will come to issue a general pardon for them. As DW News reported that Trump pardons two U.S. Army officers accused of war crimes in Iraq and Afghanistan. Do you now see how beautiful human rights are in this world we're living in? Do you see the essence of international law? Do you see the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and the Geneva Conventions on the Rights of Prisoners? How easily were all of these tossed away in the trash? All the crimes we showed you today are only what we managed to document in a short period of time, but there are many more crimes that we witnessed at the time, and the videos and picture documentation have been wiped from the internet. Like the CNN news report about the bombing of a wedding in 2002, where the occupation forces hid the traces of their bombing, the wreckage and the body parts. And this is how all traces of such crimes are also deleted from the internet. There were also crimes I couldn't post pictures of because they were just too gruesome. And there were crimes that were not filmed or broadcast and their victims suffered from only Allah knows what. Behind every number of the millions of Afghan victims, there's a story, a painful story that is unfortunately not yet over. Remember the mother, the daughter, the wife, the sister of these Afghan men who were killed, imprisoned, maimed, burned, and photographed while being tortured? These are the human rights, the women's rights, and the children's rights that Afghans have enjoyed for 20 years. Imagine after all this how tragic it is for Afghan women to lose all these beautiful rights and are forced to wear the hijab. That's why we say thank you, Biden. Thanks, because you didn't forget the women and men of Afghanistan. Thank you, Joe Biden, for your promise when you said, We will continue to provide civilian and humanitarian assistance, including speaking out for the rights of women and girls. Imagine, after all this, when a UN official in the field of cultural rights says, 
It is deplorable that the world has abandoned Afghanistan to a fundamentalist group like the Taliban, whose catastrophic human rights record, including the practice of gender apartheid, use of cruel punishments, and systematic destruction of cultural heritage when in power, is well documented. Meaning that the major catastrophic crimes of these quote-unquote fundamentalists is the gender apartheid and the destruction of the Buddha statue, while of course it's perfectly okay for China to destroy the ancient Muslim mosques in East Turkestan. The Buddha statue, which is being worshipped instead of Allah, is a cultural heritage, while the houses of Allah have no value to these people. The UN official adds, all governments and the international community must act with urgency today to prevent a massive human rights and cultural disaster in Afghanistan. These were the words of a UN official. It's not surprising if you know that the UN forces themselves are involved in rape and murder, and that more than 100 UN peacekeepers in Haiti were part of a child sex ring, and none of them were ever jailed for that. There were also other incidents for peacekeepers raping children in Central Africa. They also helped in killing and raping Muslim men and women in Srebrenica, plus other crimes. Many young people do not know any of what we have mentioned, so the international media succeeds in deluding them that they care for women's rights and are eager to defend women and human rights and so forth. Imagine when the media neglects all this and preoccupies the world with the question, will the Taliban fulfill its vows regarding the treatment of women? Their vows? Are you serious? Their vows to whom? To a society of human wolves, murderers, rapists, savages, criminals, and psychopaths who enjoy torturing Muslims? Vows in front of whom? In front of those who keep repeating in every form that their cause is to encourage women to take off their clothes, to change their gender, to fornicate, and to become lesbians? Among the early prophetic teachings that have reached people is this. If you have no sense of shame, then you can do whatever you wish. Imagine when the Western media, the media of the countries that committed all these crimes, all publish a cartoon like this one, claiming that the occupation forces have brought hope, education, and prosperity to Afghan women, while those who raise the slogan of Sharia will bring them misery and fear. And they publish an article titled, Taliban terror begins with kill lists drawn up as women face torture and death as if these Taliban were extraterrestrial beings born on Mars from women with green skin and they came to Earth to hunt every human woman to torture and kill her. My aim here is not to defend everything the Taliban has done and I can't guarantee what they might do in the coming months. And this is not an endorsement of everything they have ever done in the past. But condemning the occupation is a completely separate matter from endorsing everything that is attributed to the Taliban, whether rightly or wrongly. What concerns me is to highlight this ignorance and psychological defeat that makes some Muslims listen to those who disbelieve in Allah as they lecture us about women's rights and human rights while they are the mortal enemies of these rights. How can you believe those who accuse Muslims of having, quote, a hardline understanding of Islam? Even if your Muslim brother is mistaken in understanding some of the rulings of Islam, who has the right to criticize him? Those who are hostile to Muslims and are professionals in humiliating them and killing them just for being Muslims? How do you allow these people to toy with your mind, to fool you and shape your priorities? Regardless of any group, remember that the one who imposed the hijab on women is the creator of women, glory be to him, and that those who object to that, their problem is not with a specific group, but rather they object to Allah himself. So they're the last ones who have the right to lecture us about women. Two important points must be established now. First, what we have mentioned does not give justification to anyone, neither the Taliban nor anyone else, to oppress Afghan Muslims. No one has the right to say, no matter how much I wrong the Afghans, I'll never wrong them more than the occupation. Rather, the emerging leaders are required to have mercy with these people because they've endured the same calamities that they themselves have endured. Second, we must never be dragged by the media into trying to limit the definition of Sharia to just the 
dress, the hijab, and the prescribed punishments or the hudud. The one who takes charge of the affairs of Muslims has to take care of people's affairs, establish truth and justice, distribute wealth, fight poverty, fear Allah and foreign relations, populate the land and teach people the rulings of Islam and what is necessary for the righteousness of their religion and their lives. You can find out more about this topic on Dr. Iyad's channel. Someone might say, but you only mentioned the dark side of the occupation. Why not talk about the positive side? Talk about the reconstruction, the electricity, and the internet, establishing schools and universities. Look, dear viewers, a cheap person finds the blood of the Muslims to be cheap too. If just one of the incidents we mentioned happened to Westerners, they would have gone mad and turned the earth upside down in vengeance. Then you'll find our positive side friend silent and feeling that these Westerners have every right because they have been attacked. As for the Muslims, however, internet service and electricity is enough to make up for countless lives lost. Pharaoh's policy was mentioned by Allah in Indeed, Pharaoh arrogantly elevated himself in the land and divided its people into sects, deeming a faction of them weak and oppressed, slaughtering their sons while keeping their women alive. Deeming a faction of them weak. Likewise, the occupation tortures, kills, and rapes a group while bringing another group closer to earn their loyalty and then throws them away when they're no longer needed. The true believer says what Moses Islam, said to Pharaoh when he reminded him of his so-called favors. And is that a favor you remind me of, that you have enslaved the children of Israel? Meaning, what else brought me to your palace except that you committed a crime against my people, so much so that my mother had to throw me into the sea? Does your kindness to me erase all your crimes against the children of Israel? The American president himself said in his speech that America went to Afghanistan to eliminate what he calls terrorism and that they did not go to, quote unquote, nation build. We did not go to Afghanistan to nation build. So don't be kinglier than the king and claim that they did favors for the sake of the Afghans. Someone might say, OK, if the West did what it did in Afghanistan, then why were there Afghans fleeing and jumping on their planes despite the general amnesty that was issued to all who committed offenses? I'll tell you why. These planes came and destroyed their country and the people cling to them to escape the pain, the wounds and the destruction, as in this video in which those gathered in the airport were interviewed. In conclusion, this is a historic opportunity to call the Ummah to the religion of Allah Almighty and to remember that some of the occupation soldiers themselves converted to Islam when the facts were revealed to them and when they saw the patience, the steadfastness and the dignity of Muslims in the face of the oppression and deception of the occupation, as in this report by Reuters, which talks about the conversion of two American soldiers in Afghanistan in 2007. We ask Allah to grant Muslims relief soon, so that they may once again assume the position which is befitting to them. You have been the best community that was ever brought forth for mankind. Humanity is in need of Islam and Muslims. Wa alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.